Okay there, saints. Matthew, no, Exodus. <laughs> I mean, we finished that book. Exodus chapter 23. I was pondering a reference that is back there. So, um, let's bow our hearts. Father, we come to you. And, Lord, what an incredible blessing that it isn't our status in life. It isn't what we do, that your love for us is just because you love and you're good. It has nothing to do with us earning it or deserving it. And Father, that's the way you deal with all situations. You just, it is either for you or against you. There's never, ever a middle ground. There's no gray with you, Lord. It's just black and white. There's clarity, there's truth, there's light. And so, Father, we're, we're praying that tonight, as we look at this next part of, of Exodus 23, that you would impress upon us, Lord, your heart. You're, you're, you're blind to all the externals. You just look at truth. But you, you are very clear when you see the heart. And you don't lie when, when you speak of those things. But tonight, Lord, we want to know your heart and, and have it transformed ours, mm -hmm. transform our thinking. There's an area, Lord, of our lives where, where we're, we judge improperly. Teach us, Lord, tonight what it is to be true in, in, our, in our judgments, be true in our actions, be true in justice, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all the saints of God said, amen. amen. <laughs> all right, Exodus chapter 23. For those of you that didn't read ahead, I want to read just the first nine verses to you. It begins this, Exodus 23, verse 1, You shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. You, nor shall you testify in a dispute as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. And if you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. You shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. Keep yourself from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. And you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. Also, verse 9, you shall not oppress a stranger. For you know the heart of a stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. In this passage, as we're going through Exodus, we've talked about going through and looking at foundational principles. There's a principle that is, is based here, and, and what this is in this one area is true and right justice. And so we're looking at true and right justice, and then through that, it's going to kind of diverge a little bit once you get into verses 4, is the, the, the true and right conduct. So your judgment and what you do. And I think it's important to realize when it comes to this area of judgment. Two verses I want to give you for headers, just so that you can kind of see where we're going tonight so it can help build that foundation. So often when we refer to God and we look to how God refers to himself, we look at the great and mighty God, God Almighty, holy, 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 and, and we look to that aspect of God and we say, this is God, and truly it is. There's a, a, a verse, two verses in Psalm 68, and I want to read the very first part of verse 1 kind of to give you the header of, of what this psalm is, but I want to read verses 4 and 5 so you can really see through this how God defines himself. 
But the psalm begins, it, it's a psalm of David, says, let God arise. Now, when the psalm starts like that, you just pay attention to it. Just let God arise. Let him come and, and do what he's going to do. In verse 4, it says, sing to God, sing praises to his name, extol him who rides on the cloud by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. So you're like, oh, here he comes, here he comes. And you, know, you expect to see light and power and clouds and everything else. But then God defines himself like this in verse 5. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. I love this aspect of God. So often we look to the God of power and might and miracles. And here we see that God is a God who... His justice is right. His temperament is right. And he really is the one who looks after those who are in need. In other words, he behaves properly towards them. So keep in mind that those who are in need, it's about ministering to that need. And so when we look to this, this is really what the heart of what God teaches us to be. If you guys are familiar with that passage in, in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, we sing it sometimes. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing, but it's, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? And it says this, first thing, to do justly. That's what he requires. Just be just. What you do, do justly. Love mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. He talks about what we should be doing and how we should be doing it to be just, be right, be fair. In other words, treat people equitably. In other words, treat all people the same. And, and I think it's important that what we need to learn to do is we have to use the merits of the situation, not the merits of what we believe the people are, to make the determinations of what we do. And, and I think it's important to do that because think about it this way. There are some people that if they hear a message with someone who has a D behind their name, instantly they accept anything and they don't look to merits or they deny everything and they don't look to the merits. And the same thing if someone has an R behind their name. They, they instantly either agree or disagree, they don't look to the merits. And what happens is we have this tendency in our society to have already placed people in a position, these are trustworthy, these are not. So in other words, you can, you can trust this news organization, you can't trust the other news organization. And as we've been looking at recently, you can't trust any of them. Amen. You have to go to the merit of the situation. And so you can look to what someone is saying and how they're saying it, but I think it's important to, to not use the, the people, not use the, the views that you want, but you go to God. And you say, what does your word say on the matter? And this is where I believe the heart of God is. So we look to, you know, we've looked in the past and recently at what we have in Milwaukee. We looked at the Castle Doctrine. We looked a couple weeks ago. And we actually see that there's a part of it that's just and equitable. And there's another part that is a little extreme. So do you agree with it because, and do you go to the full extreme? No, you come back to God's word. And you say, well, it's okay that you pass that. You can do it, but I'm going to stick with God's word. That's how I'm going to act. That's how I'm going to behave. That's what I'm going to do. And so when we look to this, I think it's important to have that mindset that when it comes here, he's saying these are the mindsets that you need to have, and it needs to be with me. So what I want you to do is this. As we look to this next portion, he says this verse one, you shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. It talks about circulating in a, a false report. The way that it's termed circulate, there are other translations who say you shall not initiate a false report. And there's some truth to that. However, the word itself in this context would mean to lift up, to carry, to move it forward as well. 
So one, it means don't initiate a false report. Don't start the ball rolling. But the other thing is this, don't continue the ball rolling. So rather than someone coming and telling you something and then simply repeating what it says, because, well, this news station says it so that it has to be true. And that's what we look at. Well, are we sure that this? And so we have to look at, well, what part of it is true, what part of it's not before I pass on that information. And when it comes to circulating here, it says false reports. When a report isn't fully in the light, when the report is in the great, you need to say, we just don't know. And, and I love the heart of how God says, when it's true, you just say it's true. When it's not, you say it's not. But when, it, when you don't know, don't say anything. It's really important to really be careful to how we speak these things. Now, in, in our, our day and age, um, I don't know if you've heard of this statement when it comes to gossip. Someone said this about so-and-so, and someone said this about so-and-so, and they say, that gossip is halfway around the world when truth is barely out the door. Hmm. Gossip is spreads like wildfire. And I think it's important, do not circulate or initiate a false report. So when you know something to be true, state that which is true. When you don't know it to be true, it's a good idea. Well, don't say that it's true. Now, when it comes on to this, he adds a little bit of clarity Underneath this, he begins to say, one, do you shall not circulate a false report. But then he says, do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. That term unrighteous witness is a little bit of a misnomer. I think a better translation would be that you don't become a witness of violence. Now, it, it does, in a sense, mean unrighteous, but the term more often than, than in other ways are translated to do violence, um, to do harm. And so a, a better way to put this is do not put your hand with the wicked to be a witness that would cause harm. And that's important. There's more than one time in the scripture that this is done, we've seen it before, and I'll, I'll, I want to remind us of those two times, at least two of those times here, New Testament, Old Testament, so you can understand the foundation that is being set up. The first is found in, in 1 Kings chapter 21, you guys know that passage, we've looked at it before recently, and this is where Nabal has this, this vineyard, and Ahab wants it. He's kind of whining and crying about it. But his wife Jezebel plots and sets up these unrighteous witnesses. And through their witness, Nabal will be put to death. Let's look at this passage. In 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 1, it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Verse 2, so Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it's near, next to my house. And for it, I'll give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid down on his bed and he turned away his face and would not eat food. And then Jezebel, verse 5. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? And he said to her, because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And I can hear sniffling of, you know, and he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. It's not gonna happen. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, you now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, 
and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast, seat Naboth with high honor among the people, and seat two men, scoundrels before him, to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king, then take him out and stone him that he may die. So not only does she set up the situation, puts him to a place of false elevation, put him in a place of honor, set scoundrels among them that they can now say, hey, listen, I heard him blaspheme God, then judge him instantly on the merit of those two witnesses, take him out, stone him, kill him. Verse 11, so the men of the city, the elders and the nobles who were inhabitants of the city, did as Jezebel had sent to them, as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. And they proclaimed the fast, seated Naboth with high honor among the people. And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him. And the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him with stones so that he died. And they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. Verse 6, so it was, or 16, so it was, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got up and went down to take position of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So we begin to see here they were just setting up scoundrels, liars. And these are witnesses in a sense that come and lead to harm, lead to death. Same thing, New Testament, different situation, different names, different people. This is that one in Acts chapter 6, beginning in, in verse um, 8 through through 15, where Stephen and, and the synagogue of the freedmen come, in a sense, to a discussion. But in verse 8 of Acts chapter 6, it begins, Stephen, full of faith and the power, did great wonders and signs among the people. And then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, those of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And it says this in verse 10, that they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this, Jesus of Nazareth, will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at his face saw his face as the face of an angel. And eventually we go through and we see how they begin to counsel Stephen. And as they begin to do so, eventually they get to the point where they will stone Stephen. So it comes to this point where now, beginning in chapter 7, verse 51, he says to them, you stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute and kill those who they foretold of the coming of the just one, whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels that have not kept it? Well, eventually... In verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city, stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen. 
as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so we see here that what God is trying to say is be careful that you do not put your hand with this multitude. Don't join with the wicked. In other words, don't go to what public opinion is. Don't go to what the popular opinion is. And then, you know, literally to say this person is in error, this person is in error. And so I think it's important that when we look to this, it talks about here, do not put your hand with the wicked. Don't join them and, and become a witness that when you become a witness, a false witness of someone, that it does them harm, it puts them to death. Now verse 2. He said, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil, and you, nor shall you testify in a dispute as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. So again, we're looking at you know, true and right justice. How does this work? And we, we've talked about here, we have to use the merits of the situation, not the merits of the people. And again, we say, he says, do not follow a crowd. Now, I don't know if your parents were like my parents who say, you know, just because everybody else is doing it, does that mean you have to do it too? Follow a crowd. If everybody else jumped off a bridge, are you going to jump off the bridge too? And my thought was, well, they were all jumping off the bridge and having a good time. No one's getting hurt. I'm thinking, you know, I wouldn't be the first one off, but... I'd be like sixth or seventh, you know, that's my thought. But the, the, the truth is, is that you don't follow them. You follow what's right. And, and I think that's the purpose of the, the, the teaching of my parents. But it says you should not follow a crowd to do evil. Nor shall you testify in a dispute as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. So understand, conduct is not determined. What we do and what we want isn't determined by the, the public opinion or the popular opinion or this, or the opinion of our peers. And this is important to make a note of. We don't do this by the opinion of our peers. And so often we have a tendency of doing that. We won't go with the popular opinion of the world. We won't go to the public opinion, but we will look to our peers and we all want to sort of agree that, yeah, this is what we're going to do. But keep in mind, we need to stand on God's word. Now, if we all come to God's word and we agree there, absolutely. But we do not leave God's word for the sake of our peers. And so we don't go for the, the public opinion, the popular opinion, or the opinion of our peers. And, and believe it or not, peer pressure does not stop when you're leaving teenagehood. It just doesn't. You know, you, there, there's peer pressure in, 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 you know, when you're outside of high school, there are peer pressures among the people you work with. There's always these pressures of people thinking, what is there going to be their opinion of me when I disagree with them? And so we have a tendency of capitulating and say, okay, I'll agree with you, I'll kind of fit in here, that's my goal, and that's what peer pressure does. Two passages I want you to be aware of, both saying kind of the same thing, but the Old Testament speaks a little clearer on it, so I want to go to the New Testament first. But you understand that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, where, where, where God himself you know, begins to um, bring out the, this truth and... Oh, wait, verse 17. I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. It begins this. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. God says, come out from among them. Be separate. You need to not follow what everyone else is doing, and it's important to really have that understanding. In the Old Testament, we'll cover it further in a few weeks from now, but in Exodus chapter 33, a couple of verses, or the one verse I really want you to focus on is this, verse 16. But in Exodus 33, beginning in verse 15, and I'm going to focus on verse 16, 
He, Moses, said to him, God, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Context is, I need you to be with me. Just understand that. If your presence isn't here, don't bring us up. I don't care if all of us are going. If you're not here, we don't want to be here. And so, he says in verse 16, for how will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us. And then he says this, and this is the key to verse 16, so we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. Do you realize how separate that is? I don't care if the whole world is in one position. I'm going to stand with you, God. And I need you to recognize that when I stand with you, I'm going to have to believe one powerful truth. And that is this. You are never, ever standing alone when you're standing with God. Amen. You're just not. You can't say, I'm alone. No, God's there. So you're never alone. And I think it's important to realize you never stand alone. And, and if you're standing on God's side, just know this. You are the majority. You are the majority if you are standing on God's side because you are in the right. And, and so with God, every other voice, every other thing becomes instantly nothing. It becomes a vapor. And so it's important to recognize here what Moses is saying. He said, unless your presence is there. And then he says this, that we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are on the face of the earth. I don't care. The whole world can disagree. We are going to be with you. Now, here's the problem. Why do we have a tendency of yielding ourselves over to agreeing with the world, of wanting to be friends with the world? I think what happens is this, many times, not always, but many times when we feel alone in the vertical, I don't sense God's presence, I don't sense his moving, I don't sense the spirit, and when I, when I feel alone in the vertical, and that's the key word, I'm not alone, but I feel alone in the vertical, what does God say? I'll never leave you nor forsake you, he never will. But situations, the enemy kind of lets you say you're all alone. He's not there. He's not paying attention to you. And yet, understand, God is, God is ever-present. The Holy Spirit is living within you. But we feel alone in the vertical. And so then we try to compensate by not being alone in the horizontal. Because we just don't like to be alone. We, we, we don't like that solitude. I mean, sometimes we like solitude for a while, some people like solitude a lot longer, but eventually they're going to want to be around people. Um, it's amazing on what solitude did to our nation a couple of years ago when we went through COVID. People realized, you know what, this is not fun. Being alone and isolated from this and isolated from that, can't being able to touch, can't shake, can't, can't hug, got to keep six feet of separation, you know, that kind of stuff. They begin to wear on people. And, and we realize that, that we are... People who like to touch, especially Christians, you know, we just, we want to greet, we want to be close. And, and so when we see this, I think it's important to recognize that the reason we have a tendency of leaving the word of God and clinging to what is wrong in the horizontal and not saying I got to be separate from that and just cling to God because we feel alone, we feel isolated and, and I think it's a great word for us to, to look to because regardless, if we're never alone, this is why he makes that statement in verse 2. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute as to turn aside many after to pervert justice. So we see the, the reality of where Paul had written there in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33, where he says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. It's just true. So be careful that we don't lean to acquiesce and compromise wanting to have fellowship on the horizontal because we don't experience and feel like we have it on the vertical. So as we come to this now, 
we look to this third verse and it says this, you shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. There comes a time where we have this false sense of compassion. And so we want to make things right simply because someone's feelings are hurt or because we think that um, they're, they're, they're lower in society and they deserve a leg up even though it hasn't been earned. And we see this in our culture, we call it social justice, and we call it the, the, the reparations that we're trying to do because of what you know the, the forefathers did to someone else's forefathers. And so they're trying to, cities and states and governments are trying to say, we need to make reparations as a one culture and, and one nationality to another culture, to another nationality, even though we never did anyone wrong. But a wrong still has to be because look at the, the position that they're in. Well, keep in mind that here, this is what we're looking at. Do not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. Don't have a false sense of compassion just because of the position they're in. We need to look at the merits of the situation. The merits is this group did nothing to this group. Forefathers, yes, they should be dealt with. If they, if they weren't, then they got off on this side of heaven. They will not get off on that side of heaven. So the justice belongs to God, not something that we have to manufacture. And I think it's important because what's happening in our culture right now is there, are, there is this wrong sense of compassion. That because you can make one group very angry, and, and one group is, this, the, is the injustice has been done. And another group you can make them feel guilty, a false sense of compassion. You can then coerce them to now merit a situation and, and have the, the situation be worked out in such a way that it doesn't merit truth and justice. It's now emotion. So as we look to this, I want you to see that there's this companion verse to verse 3. In verse 3 it says, You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. Don't show a false sense of compassion. But look to verse 6. Verse 6 says this, You shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. So one, don't give a false sense of compassion to the poor but on the other hand, don't look to the poor and say you're not worthy of justice. Do you understand the balance that is being taught here? There's a real balance that we don't look to people and how we view them to make the merits. We look to the situation, to what does God say about the subject, and we look that to determine the merits of the situation. And now it comes to verse 4. It shifts a little bit as we come here. So initially we were looking at that whole area of what is true and right justice. And now we're looking at how we act out in kindness and in civil conduct. What do we do on our lives personally, daily? It says this in verse 4, If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. I love how God begins this whole discussion now in this area of kindness and civil conduct. How do you relate to one another? And he begins this conduct with what we would consider the very lowest denominator of someone that I know, my enemy. Someone that has wronged me, someone that we do not get along, and I consider him my enemy. So if I am going to give proper conduct to my enemy, then guess what? Then it just goes up from there. If, if I, whatever I should do to my friend, I should do the same to my enemy. Do you understand that the conduct and the merit is not upon the person, it's upon the situation. 
And just because he's an enemy doesn't mean that you don't help out. And so we, we look to this, and this is where he starts with what we would consider the lowest common denominator. The one who's lowest in my mind, lowest in my opinion, would be my enemy. I look to him as the lowest person. And if anyone doesn't deserve or is getting the karma that they deserve, then all of a sudden, why should I change that? I didn't take his donkey. I didn't take his ox. It's wandering. Oh, no, there's a cliff. Stop, ox, stop. You know, no. And, and then, it drops, oh, wow. Wow. Poor neighbor. Well, he just lost his ox. And then he says, no, you, you don't do that. If you meet an enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, bring it back to him. And, and I love the heart of this. Now, two passages, New Testament, kind of give us that same understanding. Jesus had taught us there in Matthew chapter 5. And I think it's important to really gravitate and understand what the heart is is that the Lord is trying to teach us. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43 through 44, um, or 48, it begins this. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, Jesus just turns the top on that. He said, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray to those who spitefully use and persecute you, that you, and this is the key, may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than the others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, verse 48, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And in that sense, we, we usually separate the be perfect and we look at, at the own, but to be perfect, to be mature, is to, well, he makes the, the rain on the good and the bad. He makes the sun on the good and the bad. Do you understand? He just brings the situation out regardless of the people that are there. And this is where God is so perfect in his kindness, so perfect in his conduct to everyone. And so keep in mind, he's still going to judge sin. He's still going to you know, accept those who believed on him by faith. But it's important to realize that Jesus taught us, love your enemies. You could almost put it like this. If he had an ox or a donkey that had wandered away, bring it back to him. Now, there's another passage in Romans chapter 12. A couple of verses, starting in verse 17. I want to read down to verse 21. But Paul himself, kind of reiterating what Christ has done, makes this statement repay no one evil for evil have regard for good things in the sight of all men now let me give you my definition of what all men is your enemies and your friends everyone and so we begin to see here this incredible heart where he, he says, I want you to have regard for good things. I want you to have the right mind of proper conduct and proper kindness towards all men. And as he goes through, he says, not, not evil for evil. If someone has done you wrong, don't do evil wrong back to them. He said, verse 8, if it's possibly as such as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And now verse 20 says this, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire upon his head. Do not, verse 21, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you have an enemy, how do you overcome that 
anger, that animosity, that hatred. Do good. Just seek to do good. How can I bless this person? And, and, and keep in mind that the initial points of blessing aren't going to be received with, oh, thank you. They're going to wonder what motive you're up to, what things, and they're still going to think bad of you. But as you continue to do what's good, as you continue to do what's right, as you continue to, in a sense, love them as God would love them, if you would do unto them as you would do unto those that love you, all of a sudden things will begin to change. And I love the heart that, that God begins to really point out that they be careful that you don't allow your enmity or hatred for a person to cause you to have the wrong conduct. And it's important. How do you judge the merit of the situation? Well, someone has lost an ox. If he's your friend, would you let the ox walk over a cliff? No, no, because, because you wouldn't want your friend to suffer that anguish. You wouldn't want your friend to suffer that loss. So why would you want your enemy to do that? And I think it's important to note here that when we look to not the people that, that are discussing and having this issue, but we look to the merit of the situation, all of a sudden things change. Now, when you look to the merit of the situation, the important thing is this. Don't lean to what people are saying. Look to what God declares in his word. When that becomes your foundation, then you can share truth. Then you're not literally passing on a false matter. You're not passing on, oh, here's the latest news that comes from this organization. And I think it's important to see that when we look to these truths, it's so important that here, what the Lord is trying to teach us is that there is a reality to our type of conduct, to what we're supposed to do. Act out in kindness. Act out in mercy. And so, you know, basically, the Lord, Lord has shown you, oh man, what is good, <laughs> what he requires. Do justly. Love mercy. You know, walk humbly with your God. Regardless of who it is that's around you because you have this beautiful relationship with the vertical, with our God. And then, of course, verse 6, that backside of, of verse 3, you shall not pervert the judgment of a poor in his dispute. In other words, when you think that someone is beneath you and someone isn't worthy, and then you begin to judge them on the merit of what you view them as, versus what God declares you should do. There's a beautiful reminder of this found in the book of James. You're probably already, your mind is going to it now as I'm speaking it. But in James chapter 2, I want to read the first 13 verses so that you can really figure out the context that is happening here. And it declares this in verse 1. James chapter 2, verse 1, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. How are you going to look at people? It says, if you are, are one who believes in Jesus Christ, that, that you have to recognize that all people are the sheep of his pasture. That they are all beloved and that God wants good to do to all of them. But he says this, and he brings out a situation in verse 2. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and you say to him, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand there. Or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and became judges with evil thoughts? It's interesting that here we begin to see a situation. Rich man, poor man. You pay attention to the rich man because well, maybe I can get something off of him. <laughs> the poor man, you kind of put him off to the side. And so the, the rich man, you want to impress him, you want to welcome him in, you want him to come back again and again. And the poor man is like, well, if you leave, there's no problem with that. And you want to minister to the one, but you don't want to minister to the other. I'm going to digress for just a second. It was a, a unique situation, Resurrection Sunday, just a couple of weeks ago. 
The resurrection breakfast was done. The service was done. And at the end of the service, a, a guy came walking into the fellowship. Some people thought a homeless guy had come in. And he wasn't dressed in the Easter vest. He did once wearing his, maybe he was wearing his Easter vest. I don't know. It didn't, we wouldn't see him as that. And he came in and people started talking to him and, and welcoming him in. And, and they said, hey, this, this guy came in and, you know, we don't know if he has any needs. And, and uh, you know, just, he just wandered in. He, he came in after the service. Well, let's just talk to him. Service isn't done. We're still here. We're still loving God. We're still ministering to people. We sat down. We talked to him. And, and uh, he'd been going to this church coming up. He's, one time he, he walked by and he saw a bunch of cars in the parking lot. I said, oh, this, this has to be a, a powerful church. It's a few blocks away from us. And so he'd gone to the church and he'd been there for about five weeks. And they sort of just left him alone. They let him come in. They let him go. They let him come in. And he said, I came to your church and people just started talking to me. And we continue to have a conversation with him. And, and so we asked him, you know, uh, as far as his faith and what he did. And he had believed in the Lord when a long time ago, kind of wandered from it. And so we talked about, you know, his faith and his walk and, and whether he had a Bible. And he goes, I, I don't. And we're, well, let's go get a Bible. So we went and we got him a brand new Bible and said, here, take it. And he's like, I didn't even come to your service. And, <laughs> you know, he says, I've been to this other church for five weeks now. And he says, and they haven't even really greeted me. And here you've been gathering around me and, and you're giving me Bibles and you're talking to me. He's like, well, praise God. You know, the, the, God loves you. That, that's the whole idea. And, and it was one of those things where he was shocked because he was treated differently at one fellowship and differently at another one. And I think this is what's important. You don't, you don't look to the one that comes in in the suit and, you, and the tie and the gold rings and, you know, and you say, yeah, you, I, I need you to come back, you know, week after week because, you know, we could really use that tithe, you know. <laughs> no, just who's ever there, you base it on that ministry. And, but this is what James is saying here in chapter 2, verse 3. He says, you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes. And you say to him, you sit in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my footstool. You, you can sit on the floor. Isn't it amazing that the good person has the, the good seat? I had read this article years ago and I was flabbergasted by it. Flabbergasted until I read the last line. And I'll, I'll tell you what the article was and I'll tell you what the last line was so that it sort of made sense to me. But they were talking about this church that had set up a new seating system in their sanctuary. And they had in the, the back, they had the metal folding chairs. They had in the, the, the middle part, they had chairs that were kind of like what we're sitting in now, comfortable chairs. And then they had in the, this one section, lazy boys. <laughs> and depending on the tithe, Depending on what they gave to the church, they were allowed to sit in these sections in the thing. But those that gave over a certain amount, they literally had lazy boys for them to sit in. They could kick back, they could relax while they were hearing the message. At the very end of it, it said the Babylonian bee, like, oh, okay, it was a, it's a whole joke. It was a joke, it wasn't real. But I thought for a second, I don't doubt that there might be churches like that. But this is what he's saying. You sit here in this good place, you stand over there. You can stand. You don't need to sit down. There's not a chair. You can stand. Rather than saying to the, the, the poor man, you know what? Have a seat. Relax for a little bit. And, and the, the rich man, sorry, the seats are taken. Stand. But you don't. He says in verse 4, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and became judges with evil thoughts? Verse 5, listen, my brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Does not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor, which would be the rich, the poor, those of your friends, and those of your enemies. You shall love your neighbor. Oh, as yourself, you do well. 
If you had an ox or a donkey that was going to go over a cliff, would you say, oh, later? No, you'd stop it. you do everything you could to prevent that from happening. And he says in verse 9, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. For you said, do not commit adultery. Also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. The perfect law of grace, the leading of the Holy Spirit. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This whole area of giving people what they don't deserve triumphs over giving them what they do. And that's where it boils down to if your enemy has an ox or a donkey going astray, well, you get what you have. Or if he has this donkey that, that has a burden that he can't walk with, he said, what you need to do is you need to go help. You need to take that load off that donkey, carry it yourself or put it on your donkey, do something to help him. You cannot refrain from helping him. You must, it says in the end of verse 5, you shall surely help him with it. That's the key. And I think what happens is this mercy triumphs over judgment. Now we think, oh, it's, it's judgment. God is judging this person. No, he's not. He's judging you. It's a test for you. What is in your heart? Is your heart to do good? Is your heart to show kindness, even to those that you think don't deserve it? And so we see here, and I think it's important, where it declares this in verse 6, you shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. Verse 7, keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. So, like Nabal, like Stephen, he says, you know, do not go. And when they're in error, you need to say, you're in error. Simply speak the truth. And now in verse 8, he shifts to a point of really making clarity to this. He says in verse 8, and you shall take no bribe. For a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. It's interesting, he makes a statement, do not be swayed by financial gain. It's interesting. There's a lot of people who literally say, I don't lie, I don't lie, I don't lie, but they will not put certain things down in their taxes. Now, why will they do that? Well, because the government already has enough of my money. And if I don't say this... Well, are you being swayed by financial gain? And it's one of those things that we see sometimes are very subtle what we do. And that is you're taking a bribe. I'm, I'm going to take and do wrong so that I can gain financially. I'm going to do wrong so I can gain either materially. And God says, do not do that. Do not do anything that, that you would, would try to gain something materially or financially and use that to sway you from doing the right thing. And that's why it says you shall take no bribe. For a bribe, a bribe the, the, the thought of more money the dis, and blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. Now, just in case you think that only the poor takes bribes, keep in mind that when one person asked Mr. Rockefeller, how much money is enough? His answer was crazy. He said, just a little bit more. It's never enough. You can always use more. I mean, you take a look at your bank account. Now, who wouldn't want a little bit more in your bank account? And so we, we look to this. And so when we have this tendency of making the wrong choice, in either our actions or our thoughts for someone so that we could gain materially, so we could gain financially. This is what it says. A bribe blinds the discerning. Those that say, well, I know what's right, but 
with this, we can make, you know, uh, an, uh, an exception for this because I don't have to report that. That was cash. That was something else. But it's true. The government says what? If you had income, you mark down the income. And I think it's interesting that the bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. Have you ever heard the term money speaks? Money speaks. You're like, hey, you want that? Money speaks. Oh, yeah, okay. I, will, you know, I, I wouldn't listen to what you're saying, but you give me enough money, I'll pay attention to you now. Money speaks. And maybe you've heard your money speak, right? It says goodbye. <laughs> you know, go to the gas pump. It says speaks. It says see you later. It was nice knowing you. I'm gone now. Money speaks. And but what it says is this: it 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 perverts the words of the righteous. You know it to be true, but because of gain, because of you could gain either monetarily or materially. You, you change what you say and you, how you change it so that you can gain from that. And then lastly, it says this in verse 9, you shall not oppress a stranger for you know the heart of a stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. This is, is so beautiful, the way that, that here he ends this whole understanding of, of how we need to be kind and, and the conduct that we do to one another. There's a passage, you're aware of it. I want to read it to you, though. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, I want to jump down to verse 19. But it talks about this. Paul, in writing to the church of Ephesus, in chapter 2, verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens. Let's call that strangers. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And verse 19, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. It's interesting that so often when you have a house that is run well, that is run under the heart of God. That there are going to be certain times and certain instances where someone is not able to do something that everyone else is able to do. And because of that situation, others have to do what? They have to step up. And it's just true. So there, there, there comes a, a season. You know that, that you know, when I had broke my ankle and shredded the tendons you know, last year, I was, I was laid up. All summer, I was, you know, after the surgery, I just had to just be laid up, was doing nothing. My, my wife was doing all the work. And, and it was interesting that, you know, we have this tendency of, of, of looking to thinking, oh my, you know what, um, this person in the family isn't holding up their end. But no one in my family thought that. I had son-in-laws come over. I had, you know, daughters come over. I had... Um, my wife stepped up. I had all kinds of people, um, you know, come and assist with tasks. In the church, people stepped up even more, and they didn't look at me like I was slacking. And it was really interesting because it was like, oh, you know what? This is what we are, fellow citizens of the saints. We're members of the same household. We're all part of the family. And sometimes we can do more. Sometimes we can do less. I had a brother, and, and I, I think he did this on purpose, but he manage somehow to get an allergy to mustard. Now what happened was we had these oat fields and mustard would grow in it and we had to go through manually, manually pull out acres, acres of mustard out of these fields so that they wouldn't be caught up in, 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 the, in the oats. My brother, I think he faked it. I, I know he faked it. To this day, I know he faked it. He faked an allergy. He never had to go out and pull the mustard. Never had to. And, and I, I, I don't know for sure because we were out pulling mustard in the fields, but I think he was back home sipping lemonades. And, and, but it, it's important to realize, you know what? You're all a family. And, and it's important not to judge when someone's not able to do something. And this is what he says here in verse 9. You shall not oppress a stranger. For you were once, you, you know the heart of a stranger. You were a stranger. 
And I think it's so beautiful. Bring them in as family. Bring them in as you would someone that you love and someone that you cherish. And I think this holds true to that first part where we're looking there in verse 4. If you meet your enemies. I think you need to bring them in. Love them as a stranger. Love them as a part of the family. And, and even though they may not be part of the family yet, they may be a future part of the family. What do you want to do with that? <laughs> you want to love them. You want to have that impression being, you know what, I'm going to do this because, God, you call me to do this, and it's simply right. I'm not looking to people to determine the merits of the situation and what this person says of this. I'm looking to what your word says is the merit of the situation, and that's what I'm going to do. And, and I think it's important for us that when we look to this, this whole principle of justice, how we think and how we act, that this portion here brings out such a beautiful, in, in a sense, narrative that you can actually see in word pictures what these truths mean. And so you can take this one word picture and then extrapolate it to how does it fit now in this situation, which is just a beautiful thing. So here's God. And, and as he, he winds up this section here, dealing with these civil laws, he comes all the way down to the point of what is my mindset to how I act? And then what are my actual actions? Is it just? Is it right? And, and I think it, it's a good word for us um, to, to just... Um, ponder through and really look inside our own hearts and our own minds to how do I treat people and how do I judge them and how do I put them in categories as well. Father, we are so grateful for this passage, for this word, how faithful you are, how good. You, Lord, are a God of justice. It is so amazing that you ride in the heavens and we see your power and your awesomeness and yet you go and you defend the widow and the orphan. You, you go and you do what's right to the very least. And Lord, so often the, our, our culture sees the, the least and, and they, they, they try to have a false justice. So often others see the least and, and they do wrong justice. They oppress. And so often we see the, the least is how we view them, enemies, those who are least in our, our esteem, we look to them as the lowest people as far as favor, and you would call us to love them, to do good to them. Lord, help us to grasp the vertical. Help us to look to your word, to believe that this is how I need to act in this situation, even if no one else does, Lord. Even if the whole world is going to be in one way, we want to be separate from the world. We want to be separate. We want to be yours because you're with us. And we want the world to be evident that the things that we do is because we have your Holy Spirit in us and that you love. And because you love us and you love them, you've used us and you want to use us to be instruments of that love. Teach us to do those things, we ask in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God said, amen. amen.